All right, everyone. So today we're going to start talking about Nile civilization. So this basically means we're going to talk about ancient Egypt and what made up the different parts of ancient Egypt. So let's get started. The first thing you need to realize is that Egypt is a part of Africa and it spans in an area that's mostly desert. But part of Egyptian culture and civilization would eventually go up into what is what we know as Mesopotamia and the Fertile Crescent. So we're basically going to be just talking about how Egypt is one of the longest lasting empires and government systems, as well as civilizations to exist to this day. Now, the big highlight of Egypt is the Nile River. It's one of the longest rivers in the world, and it's the source of life due to the fact that the rest of Egypt is very much desert. So without the Nile, people would not live into Egypt. Now, the other big thing to note is that the Nile floods, but it's a very predictable flooding. So unlike the Tigris and Euphrates, the Nile would flood every year at a certain time up to a certain point. And the Egyptians knew that, so they knew how close they could live without fear of being flooded. And they know, knew exactly when those floods would happen. Now, there's two parts of a river we need to kind of quickly just go over. One is the Delta. And this is where... The river is ending, and this is the most fertile soil for the entire river. And this is where there's a lot of silt, a lot of that good soil that I've talked about, where you are not going to have crops without the silt or the really rich soil. But it provides a lot of good nutrients, if, as long as they could get to it and then harvest it, good thing. And the other one is big is cataracts. And this is basically just waterfalls that make it where it's really hard to pass. You have to get out of your boat, carry it down a big giant hill or mountainside before you can keep going. So both the delta and the cataracts or the waterfalls make it really hard to travel the Nile beyond certain points. Now, the Nile itself runs different. Most people would expect that the river, looking at the image, would go from the top to the bottom, but the Nile actually goes from the bottom to the top. So it goes from the south to the north which is unique, but also allows the civilization to thrive in the way that they do. So just another image to look at real quick of the Delta, kind of seeing how it's kind of rocky, not the best to live on. But if you know what you're doing, like we do in modern days, you actually can. Those are the cataracts. So not that easy to navigate. Definitely don't want to take a boat across them unless you really want to wreck your boat and possibly die in the process. So, we're going to start talking about kingdoms. Generally, how we talk about Egypt is talking about different kingdoms. And one of the first one is the northern kingdom and the lower kingdom. So, the northern and lower kingdoms. Actually, I should clarify that the northern kingdom is called the lower kingdom. And it has a pretty mild uh, climate. And they use a cobra as their little mascot or symbol. The southern kingdom is called upper Egypt. And it's a warmer climate and they kind of worshipped and used the vulture as their little mascot. Now, I'm mentioning how they're in the north because the kingdom that's in the north is the lower kingdom. And the southern, uh, the kingdom that's more southern is actually upper Egypt. So they're flip-flopped of how you would expect them when you're looking at an image where the top you'd expect to be upper, but it's not. It's actually in reverse, just like the river itself. Now, eventually these two kingdoms would unite, and the ruler Menes, or Menes, he was in control of Upper Egypt, so the one in the south, and he actually founded a city called Memphis, which is still a very popular city name, if you don't know. And they put both the snake and the vulture together, to make one mascot or one crown, and this would be the first of 31 dynasties or rulers or phases in the Egyptian history, which is why it's one of the most stable. So, as you can tell, a lot of things going on. So, here's the image to kind of depict it. If you look at the top of the image, as I said, that's the lower Egypt, and when you go south, it's upper Egypt. So, it's flip-flopped of how we would expect it to be, but it's going with the flow of the river, so it makes sense. So here are some images of 
the different crowns, as you can tell on the top right image, that it has both a cobra and a vulture. And that's just one of the ways that they would portray the different two mascots or religious animals showing a unified front. Here is the vulture of what it would look like. And but minis, he would put the two crowns together. The white one was from the upper, the red was from the lower, and he put them together and kind of combined all the symbols to try and show a unified country and try to blend the things together. Just like when schools, when they blend, how they may take the colors from one school but the mask off from another. It's just a way to try and give everybody some part of their culture and letting them keep some part of their identity while at the same time making a new one that includes everybody. All right, so some images of ancient Egypt, some of them you probably have seen. So one of the big ones is that Egypt is well known for their pyramids. There are lots of different pyramids. We'll get into them more later. But the question that I will ask in class and for us to answer together after the video is, how did the geography affect where they, the early Egyptians lived? And we'll talk about it more, but honestly, it's mostly due to the fact that the river provided a narrow strip of land, so they just stayed with the river, which makes sense due to the fact that they're in a desert. Okay, so the Old Kingdom. The Old Kingdom is characterized by the fact that they built the pyramids. It's near a city called Giza, and these pyramids are basically tombs or burial sites for their rulers or kings or emperors, depending on how you want to call them. But basically, these tombs or pyramids would be filled with treasure made out of gold really fine materials, the best of the best, so that when the ruler died, he could be buried with all these possessions and all these nice objects to take with him to the afterlife. Now, the first pyramids were rough, but over time they would change into a smoother sided where they're more of a pyramid and less of a stair step level. And the pyramids would take a very long time to build because there was a lot of criteria. They wanted them in certain positions with the sun and the moon and to line up with the peaks. And so they were doing all of that on top of the fact that they're building these big giant pyramids by hand. They didn't really have all that many advances to help them. Everything was built by hand. Yes, they used logs and wheels to help them move things, but they still had to use people and camels to move everything. And it wasn't built by slaves. A lot of people might think that, but it's not. They would often use peasants. Peasants would be taken from their homes and saying, hey, you're basically being drafted or enlisted to work for the, for the uh, emperor for a while, and they would pay you. And you would leave for whatever month they told you to, and you'd work that entire month for the government to help the emperor. And they would just do a rotation. So this is an example of the early pyramids. As you can tell, it's more of a stair-step idea where... It's not smooth. It looks like giant staircases. But over time, it would turn into this, where it's smooth. And over time as well, the pyramids have broken down a little bit. They used to be covered in white stone and were very, very beautiful. But people have come by and looted. As you can tell, in the middle smooth pyramid, there is still the very top of it that has been pretty much left alone. You can see how there was a difference. So looking at the overall top picture, the pyramids are slightly away from Giza, but they're not that far. And as time has gone on, the city of Giza has gotten a lot closer to the pyramids. And there's actually a lot of pyramids. The biggest ones are the ones that are known for Khufu, Khafre, and Menkor. And there's a bunch of other small ones for queens. There's some for smaller, like the younger, not the younger, but the earlier pharaohs. And this is where we get the Great Sphinx. This is where we get all the things that we think of when we think of Egypt. Okay, now the pharaohs. This is what we call the ruler of Egypt. They are called pharaohs. Not emperors, not kings, but pharaohs. Now, the pharaohs were seen as a god. They were seen as descendants from a direct god. So therefore, they had almighty power. Not just in the sense of the government, but they had a lot of religious pull because they're a god or a child of God. So therefore, they have power. Now, this type of system is called a theocracy. So basically, it's where your government is led by someone in the religious sector, or somebody who's like a priest, someone who's 
a religious figure who has say in the church and your religion, they have say in the government and they rule over it. Now, the pharaoh, he did have help. It's called bureaucracy. So bureaucracy is basically where you take all the jobs that you have and you kind of assign the smaller ones that are not the top priority to you to other people for them to take care of it for you. So basically, you delegate your work. So instead of you doing everything on your list of to-dos, you may hand some off. So think of it like the chore list at home. If mom and dad have 10 things, they may take care of the, like the mowing and the, all the bills and you know mechanical work and fixing things where you and your siblings may be in charge of maybe laundry, cleaning the dishes, putting away laundry, dusting, using the vacuum, things like that. Smaller things that, yes, they can do, but it would help them a lot if someone else did just to make their life a little bit easier. All right, so another question is what Egyptian institutions were developed during the Old Kingdom? Basically, it was a government where the pharaoh had a very structured, people had job descriptions where he's like, all right, your sole thing is to take this off my plate. That's the only thing you're ever going to do. I'm not going to ask you to do anything else. If there's something new that needs to be taken care of, I'll bring somebody else in and they're going to do it. And that's going to be their sole job. And that's just how he worked it. Now, the old kingdom would eventually collapse. Now, all that means is that that line of family or those people who were kind of in charge faded out. And a new group of people kept the same ideas, didn't really change a whole lot, but it's a new family. Now, this is called the Middle Kingdom. And the Middle Kingdom had very strong leadership. Like, the Middle Kingdom is kind of seen as, like, a glory days of ancient Egypt. And they started really trading with the people around them. They started really building up the safety and security of the Nile by building fortresses. But eventually, their time would fall, too. Just like anything, there's a bit of a circle of life going on where you have your heyday. But over time... You know, things settle down, things will be great, but over time, things diminish because that's how things naturally happen, and there'll be a switch. Oh. Big thing to know about the Middle Kingdom is that they came to power after 200 years of the Old Kingdom falling. So after the Old Kingdom, there was about 200 years of uneasiness, things were constantly switching, no one could really stay in power, but they came in, they ruled... And they really started trading, building power, showing that they had the authority to take over. But eventually, invaders came in and conquered them. They're called the Hyksos. And basically all it means is that they were someone more powerful on the playground. Now, the invaders, they became what is known as the New Kingdom. And they ruled for about 100 years. They weren't truly that harsh and they weren't mean but they were outsiders so people hated them now eventually people who lived within egypt from the city of thebes would take back over but this allows change this is where we start seeing eventually a culture shift and a change in art and geography and different types of rulers that come along and at this point in history, the Sahara Desert and the waterfalls were not that big of a deterrent. We're getting to a point where people could travel a little bit more readily. And those natural fences I've been talking about with Mesopotamia, with Egypt, they kind of fall. People learn to overcome them. They're no longer as difficult. It's an easier task. So people go, why not? And because of the fact that those natural barriers aren't keeping people out, we start seeing Egypt build a very strong permanent army, which means people are in the army and you're in there for life or you're in there for a certain amount of time and the army never disappears. Now, when they build their army, this is when they start going out and invading other lands themselves and conquering lands and becoming this big power that people know of today and think of. So, yes, they head into the Middle East, they head into Asia, a place called Nubia, which we will cover. But yes, they start going beyond their Little Nile River and start expanding their lands as much as they can because they can. Remember, the, now the big kids on the playground. They have sway, they have power. So we start seeing a shift. 
and here's a nice little map that shows you. So basically, you know, you start seeing them going to different areas. They go into Babylonia, Arabia. They're going into Greece. They're going farther down the Nile, into the desert a little bit more. And they're really just pushing their spread and their power quite a bit. Now, there's a few people I am going to talk about. One of them is Hachesput. She is a woman pharaoh. And she's recognized as one of the only ones because there are other ones who would other females would take some control, but they're not recognized yet because we don't have any real documentation or proof that they were in control. But Hechesput definitely had documentation. She was a female pharaoh, which was very uncommon. You remember ancient times, women seen mostly as property, but she took the reins and she wanted to do, be treated like a man. So oftentimes for her statue, she is depicted with man-like features and clothing. So that people would respect her because women were seen as lesser. Now, over time, Egypt would switch from really going with worshipping the cobra and the vulture to really focusing more on the gods. And their big one was the Aten. So Aten was the sun god. And he was kind of seen as the big one. He was the main guy on campus that a lot of people knew. And for a while, eventually, it would come to where people would only worship Aten. So instead of being polytheistic or many gods, it became monotheistic or one god. And they would build a temple just for uh, Aten at a city called Akhenaten. So you can see his name is at the very end. But once Menhoptep, fell out of power, that changed back to the polytheism or many gods. So Egypt really does have a lot of switches in there. So this is one hit. Amen generally was what he's getting called as Amen in history. And there is some links and suspicions and thoughts that Amen may be the father to King Tut, but the evidence has not been gathered. So it's still a bit of a argument back and forth. So here's some images of Hachesfa, and as you can tell, it seems more manly. She's wearing a lot of things that the men are often depicted in instead of a womanly idea, just for the fact that she wanted to be seen as a ruler. She knew that to be taken seriously, she needed to be seen as a man. So some more images of different ways that people are depicted. This is Amen. He actually had a very famous wife as well. She's one of the ones who had a lot of control. This is here in the bottom right picture, a picture of the two of them. He's on the left, she's on the right. And she would actually get some very famous publicity in modern times for a statue. But after he died, it is believed that she kind of kind of took the reins and didn't get credit for it due to the fact that it wasn't recognized by the general people. So another one of those where... We had to wait for evidence. Now, the next one I have to talk about is Ramses the Great. And he expanded the empire more. Some people call him Ramses. Either is correct, honestly. But he expanded. He went into Syria, so more into the Middle East. And he started fighting with the Hittites, if you remember them, from Mesopotamia. Well, they were fighting for quite some time. And then eventually they did sign a truce. And he married a Hittite princess, and that completely ended the fight because now they're relatives, and now they kind of have the family bond of, we kind of have to get along. Now, Ramses, he loved spending money. He loved showing his wealth. So he built a lot of temples, a lot of monuments, all for him, and to show that he is a great person. And he outdid everybody. He spent way more than any other pharaoh ever has, and it's still baffled to this day of how much he spent. So here is a nice, lovely map that just kind of shows you where everyone's at. You can definitely look at it all you want, but I'm not going to spend too much time on it because it's just a brief kind of snapshot of what does different things look like. And it shows you how the Egyptian empire butts up against the Hittite empire. So... Here are some more temples. As you can tell, these things are very huge. They're very ornate. These statues are not little. They're not human size. They are 20 plus feet usually. And 
in great detail. So the closer you get, the more you see about them. Now, eventually Egypt would see a decline in the Pharaoh age and Ramses, he eventually died and his successors really had a problem showing the same level of authority as Ramses. So this opens them up for attack. And sure enough, some uh, there are different sea peoples. They start being invaded. The Hittites, you know, they they die out. Their empire collapses. So you see a lack of uh, power on that side of the empire. So you start seeing their control for Syria starting to fall. So a lot of things are just happening on top of each other. And eventually Egypt would break into these small states or little regions that would have foreign rulers for about 700 years. So, you know, different people like the Kushites, the Libyans, Assyrians, Persians, Greeks, and obviously Rome would come in and take control of different parts of Egypt over different times. So, the New Kingdom, it was the last one. They built a strong military, but eventually things would collapse despite the strong military having a very strong empire and having a lot of trade. It eventually does fall. So another lovely map to just kind of show you the different ways that Egypt was broken up after its fall. And that's the end of my PowerPoint. Now, I know I went fast, but I want to be able to talk about this, make sure that we have time to work on other things today. So definitely, if you need to slow down the video, repeat, pause, do what you have to do. I'm never going to tell you only watch it once at speed because everyone works different, as I keep saying. But now that you're finished, go ahead and Close this video, take out your headphones, and see what makeup work you possibly have in other classes. Let me know you're done.